Welcome to the Project Zion podcast. This podcast explores the unique spiritual and theological gifts Community of Christ offers for today's world. Welcome to Hebrew, the Project Zion series that reduces Old Testament bitterness through explanation, exploration, and experiencing the text. Our guides through the Old Testament, or Hebrew scriptures, are Tony and Charmaine Shabala-Smith, and I'm your host, Karen Peter. In today's episode, which we've sort of titled The Davidic Monarchy, David, Bathsheba, and the Me Too Movement, our episode looks at the Davidic monarchy specifically, David, Nathan, and of course, Bathsheba. So we're in 2 Samuel. For those of you who are wanting to reread stretches of the Old Testament, and I have to tell you, 2 Samuel, while about David, has a lot of stuff happening in there, much of it to women, and none of it good. So just be prepared when you read it. So let's start in with this particular text, Tony and Charmaine. What do we need to know? So first of all, we're we're in the books of Samuel and actually Kings too. And in our English Bibles, these are divided into two books, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings. That's an old tradition that goes back to the Septuagint, which was the ancient Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. The Septuagint translators took these these books of the Hebrew Bible when they were putting them into Greek and divided them in two. And except in Jewish circles, pretty much ever since then, those books have been divided. Uh, In the Hebrew Bible, it's Samuel and Kings. So those are the books that that we're in. And and Samuel and Kings together tell the story of the rise and fall of an Israelite monarchy. So you start off in Samuel. It's the end of the period of the judges when the people of Israel are really this kind of loose confederation of tribes. And occasionally when dire need Uh, emerges, Yahweh raises up a judge. And we talked about judges in our our last uh, podcast. Judges, uh, the Hebrew word shofet, a judge was not so much a judicial figure, though they could do that. A judge is more like a, you know, a, a charismatic tribal military leader. And so that whole episode in their story kind of spirals out of control by the time you get to the end of book of the book of Judges. And so in the book, in, in the, the start of Samuel, the people of Israel start wondering about and asking for a king. And so what you have in Samuel and Kings then is a monarchy emerges. The monarchy passes after, after one king, it passes to David. And then David and his son Solomon are the monarchy at its height. And then the, the rest of the story in the Hebrew Bible going through the book of Kings is kind of a a tragedy, almost a Greek tragedy, really, as the monarchy divides in, into two parts at the death of Solomon, a northern one, Israel, a southern one, Judah, and then eventually the northern one is destroyed by the Assyrians. And then by the time you get to the end of the book of Kings, the Judean monarchy, the Davidic monarchy, is ending in Babylonian exile. So it's kind of a wild ride through those <laughs> those two books. Uh, going up, going down is pretty much how, how it happens here. So that's the storyline of the books that we're in. And let's go to some contextual features about this monarchy. So you might ask the question, so how did this loose collection of tribes, Israelite tribes, who shared some ancestors like Abraham and Sarai and shared a language, Hebrew, and shared some founding sacred stories and rituals like the Passover and the Exodus. How, how did they come to create a monarchy sometime you know, late in the 11th century BCE? The traditional date for Saul's, Saul becoming king is 1020 BCE. So how did that happen? And the critical historian will give you a different answer <laughs> from what the texts might give. Oh, well, this will be good. Yeah, yeah. So the historian's answer would be something like this. 
So as Israel is emerging in Canaan, something major is happening along the seacoast. A group of sea peoples who trace themselves back to the Aegean Sea, these people called the Philistines, are landing on the coast and setting up settlements. And so they are a superior military and political power. They're really well organized. They have superior uh, uh, Weapon. weapons, yeah, superior strategy. weaponry strategy. They know how to fight well. And then you have these sheep herder people <laughs> learning the ropes in in Canaan, uh, who uh, have bronze weapons, not iron weapons, and who don't know what they're doing, actually. <laughs> and so one, one historically plausible answer for why a monarchy emerges is that as those Philistines settle the coast and begin moving inland and start running into Israelite tribes, that the Israelites realize that they can't, that, that what's been working for them isn't working anymore, right? So they, they need to have some kind of centralized authority, some kind of centralized way of creating an army that can withstand the Philistines. The other thing too, is you have to remember Canaan is this little tiny neck of land. That's, that's sort of the, sort of like the, the freeway between empires, Egypt to the South and then Aram or Syria and then Assyria and Babylon to the North. And everybody wants this little strategic piece of land. So tribes are just not going to be able to do it. So you have to have some kind of centralized authority. And a king seems like a good idea. And everybody else has one. Exactly. So, heck yeah. You know, we ought to have one too. So uh, there are there are plausible you know, historical, social, cultural, and economic reasons why a monarchy would develop. Now, the authors and editors of Samuel and Kings, and I'm using the words authors and editors because what we have here in Samuel and Kings these are like community writing projects, right? These books are created out of many different sources. Lots of hands have been involved in them. The authors and editors of Samuel and Kings are finishing their editorial work on these books in the Babylonian exile. When they're trying to answer the question, how in the heck did we lose it all? So if the monarchy is beginning like around 1020 BCE, and these books are coming together in the form we're reading them uh, in translation, Sometime you know after 587 BE, BCE, you know almost 500 years going on there. Mm -hmm. um, the the people in exile are trying to think how what did we do to deserve this? How did we get here? How did we lose everything? How did we lose this monarchy? How did we lose our homeland? Right? They're an, they're asking theodicy questions. Where is God? Why did this happen to us? One answer, not the only answer, but one answer was the Deuteronomists' answer. The Deuteronomists, another school of thought in ancient Israel. Their answer was because we because we were disobedient and we had a, we had a monarch and we had and we and we sinned and we followed other gods. It's our fault we're here. We didn't. Trust so that's God that's not a happy uh, answer. No, that, no, no, it's not a happy answer. It's <laughs> it's 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 one of the answers. It's a theological interpretation of why they're in exile, and it's it's sort of overlaid throughout Samuel and Kings. Right. right. So, so I have a, I need to insert a question here when, because right. we have this through the whole situation, the yep. Deuteronomist perspective, we sinned, we were disobedient, bad things happened to us because that's what happens when you're disobedient to God. That's a narrative that's still out there. Oh, yes. We yes. hear it all the time. Yeah. After every natural disaster, you hear, well, this is God's punishment because whatever the city was that, the, that experienced the disaster, they must be sinful, and this must be God's punishment of them for that. So that's a popular um, reason that we hear. What are the other perspectives on that? It's it's popular because people people don't read the, the Bible very well. That's one reason it's popular. It's also <laughs> popular because it's simplistic, and the people with whom it's po popular never say it about themselves. Right. They, it's always a, an explanation of others. Right. Those people had this thing happen to them because unlike us. Right. They did right. something wrong or okay. they think something wrong or they're for some something in society that's obviously God is against. So and I said they don't read the Bible. Well, they don't, because here's the deal. The Hebrew Bible has other explanations. OK. And the Hebrew Bible has texts that push back on the Deuteronomist explanation for things. For example, the book of Ezekiel chapter 18 
uh, Ezekiel basically says, you know that idea we've had for like a thousand years that if if you if you sin, it'll be put on the, the generations after you. Ezekiel says, God says, stop saying that. That's dumb. <laughs> You're responsible for your own stuff. That might be a bit of a paraphrase. As I'm, para- I'm paraphrasing, but it's basically. I like the paraphrase. Basically. Stop saying that. That's dumb. Be responsible for your own behavior. Exactly. And then, and then the book of Job totally pushes back on the idea that somehow what has happened to us was deserved. Right. That it's the just punishment for what happened, for, for, for what we did. Right. So there's other voices in the Hebrew Bible that say, I don't think so. And so even, it helps to keep that in mind as we go through yes. this particular. And, and this is important even in this story because that that doesn't really fit on the David story. If you think of the David story, here is David who is doing all kinds of things wrong. And he's not cut off from God. Yes, there are some consequences for some of his behaviors, but God does not desert him. He, and you know, in fact, he's even with all the stories and all the commandments that he breaks, God is still there with him and for him. And this is a merciful God and a God of grace and a God who um, lives for love. And so uh, even within these stories, you've got both, you've got the Deuteronomistic kind of approach. If, you, if, you're, if you're getting bad stuff in your life, you must have done bad. Um, but you're also getting this God who is faithful to us, even when we fall to the very bottom of our, mm-hmm. our in, it, it, embracing evil or desire or whatever um, inordinately. So so it's there yeah. too. These these themes are there running side by side. And it and you know, always, and we probably said this before, we, we always have to ask, um, what is it about you that chose this theological perspective <laughs> rather than this one when they're judgmental, both... angry God? Right. right. Well, it's yeah. the same with like the creation stories back in Genesis. Why did you choose the second one as being normative for the relationship between men and women instead of the first one, where we are both representative of the image of God? Our, so. our uses of the Bible often tell say more about us than they say <laughs> about the Bible. So that's why scholarship is really important, because it helps us get out of that loop. By the way, also, as, as Christian readers of a Bible that has two testaments, we say Jesus rejected the idea that what happens to you is a judgment, right? In Luke's gospel. And in John's gospel, uh, that comes up and Jesus says, nope, don't think so. <laughs> right. So um, in other words, the, it's really important to see the Bible as a, sometimes a conversation, sometimes an argument around a seminar table <laughs> uh, and and not not to simply get fixated on whatever simple answer helps you feel good about you and 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 feel righteous about your enemies. Right. So. So uh, it's pr- pretty important. And so the, the Deuteronomists, uh, I'll say the Deuteronomists, their, their theology is overlaid more on kings than on Samuel, but it's there. It's, it's through it all because they're the ones who are helping kind of collect the, 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 the prophets, that is the narrative books, starting with, with Joshua. They're the ones who are pulling that stuff all together during the exile. But um, it's really important to see it as an overlay. And every once in a while in the text, you'll see a, a peekaboo of other traditions would say, no, nah, there's another way to look at this. Right. So, so, so one more thing uh, in terms of explaining the Hebrew Bible has a number of covenant traditions, right? God makes a covenant with Abraham and Sarai. It's an unconditional covenant, you know, trust, you, you just trust me. I'm going to make sure you have land and, and progeny and that you're, 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 those who descend from you will be a blessing to the nations. Right. And there'll be a lot of them. Right. <laughs> and then there's the Mosaic Covenant, which is more of a conditional covenant. I, you know, based on Hittite covenant treaties, I, Yahweh, your God, got you out of Egypt. And I've brought, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to bring you to a good land. And here's what I expect from you. And the, the Mosaic Covenant is rendered differently in Exodus and then in uh, Deuteronomy. But in both cases, it's kind of a conditional covenant. Now, in 2 Samuel 7, there's a new covenant, God's covenant with David, God's pact, God's treaty, God's deal with David, where God says to David through Nathan, 
Um, I'm going to make a dynasty out of you. And if, if, you're, if, if your children who serve as kings after you mess up, there'll be consequences, but I will never take my steadfast love from your house. There will always be a Davidic monarch. That's the unconditional nature of the Davidic covenant. That's articulated in chapter seven of Second Samuel. And one of the stories we're going to focus on here shortly, the David and Bathsheba story, put the covenant to the test. That covenant, though, turns out to have some disastrous moral consequences down the road as Judean monarchs think, hey, we're, we're good. We're just good. We're just good. And then they, they continue to perpetuate injustice in the land. That's a a story for another another podcast on the prophets. So well, and and some of that, um, the promises, the implications or chosen implications of that promise are still at work in the world today, as far as the the land of Israel and Palestine, and uh, what was it that God promised to whom when? So it still has reverberations today. So. Uh, so we're going into the explore part, and uh, we'll be starting to look at some of the specific stories. And Karen, I'm glad you've been doing this wide reading, <laughs> as painful as it's been for you, uh, <laughs> through Samuels and Kings. And, you know, we're really looking forward to some of the insights that you have in the, and the questions, but also bringing to the surface some of the stories that are there that, um, you know, make us raise our eyebrows and go, what? So, but before we do that, I just wanted to give us the reminder about what our goal is in these Hebrew uh, sessions. And our job here is, is not to put makeup on the stories and give them an acceptable <laughs> appearance. That's definitely not one of the things we're trying to do. Our goal here is first to understand the time that these things were written, the dynamics, and the relationships. And I think that's one that we maybe haven't noted as much, but that's really what we're looking at quite often is what about these relationships, especially relationships with God? So our goal here is it's not to judge the scripture using our own time, which is so enlightened, of course, as the primary way of de determining its value. And it's not to defend it like, oh my goodness, it's it's scripture, it, it must be right, or to twist it into a happy story in some way. That we're not, those aren't our goals, but it's also not to toss it, to just say, oh, this is unacceptable for us today. And so we're gonna just out the window with this. So we want to say, let's dig in, let's take a look at these human beings who are trying to write about their experience with God, their understanding of God, the things that have been passed on to them about God. These are human writers using the language and the culture of their time mm -hmm. to try and pass on these glimpses of, of God or God encounters that they've had. And they only have their time and language to work with. And they only have the way of being that they can see and know, and it's been passed on to them. Yes, little changes happen over time, but they, they're not going to think like we do. They, they couldn't. There's no way that they can. And so we will see, as we're reading these things, blind spots, you know, that these writers had. Um, you're going to be looking at a culture where women are being passed around as kind of like a monetary object or or as a as as flesh <laughs> you know being being used um, to gain power for for a man for one man to another man all those kinds of things but that's the reality of that time and rather than just saying oh my gosh that's awful let's let's see what else they know besides the culture that they're a part of. So that's what we're going to be kind of trying to look in and saying, you know, we have to check our desire to either judge the, the these people in their time or to skip over the ugly parts of the stories, because sometimes it's the ugly parts where we really get to begin to see what is the nature of God in this story? 
So scriptures are really not so much about the people or their cultures. It's, it's what they're trying to point to about what is the nature of this God. And there's some pieces that they're going to say that we're going to say, mm, it doesn't sound like my God. <laughs> and and that's, that's certainly something we need to be able to say is that there's some elements of their understandings of God that, especially if we're using the Jesus lens to help us determine um, who God is, that we can just say, nope, that, that doesn't fit. And we need to be okay with saying there's parts, there's some ideas in the Old Testament. My goodness, um, so much a product of their time. They just aren't translatable. But there may be some that are. So, um, so we shouldn't be surprised if we actually find some things that they're saying that may speak to us. And so that's our approach is let's listen to people's stories about what they think about God. Let's see if some of them fit for us. And if there's some things to, to dig out of the, their understandings that still have power and relevance for us. So we're going to hear them out before we uh, either dismiss or simply gloss over. Right. Or right. accept wholeheartedly as though this is exactly how we should all be today, which right. there are people who do that. And so <laughs> we're, we're not. Yes, going they to- do. But again, read <laughs> Second Samuel because that is not happening. So <laughs> well, it's, it's really important for us to pay attention to the <clears throat> details in these stories, because if we don't, our own lenses and biases and presuppositions will get quickly overlaid on the story and we'll think we're reading the story when in fact we're just reading ourselves. So, so when we get to this David and Bathsheba and Nathan's story, it's like, it's almost like a drama in three acts in, in second Samuel 11 and 12. And so this, this story is just really, uh, oh my gosh, it's, it's so disturbing and so, and, and so, uh, gut-wrenching to read what's happening here, especially if you pay attention to the details in the text. Right. And it, I'm afraid that these are stories that have been glossed over so much that it's almost like people have taken the children's Bible version of it and just let that stand as as good enough understanding of what's really happening here. And, and we, you have to we need to take it more seriously than that. So yeah. do you want to tell us about what's in these well, chapters? I'll start and just, we'll, okay. we'll just go back and forth. Okay. So, so here's, here's, here's the scene. David's kingdom is well established. He's, you know, he's, this covenant has been made. David's feeling really good. His men are out fighting somewhere on the front. He's taking a nap in the afternoon. It's springtime. It's springtime. <laughs> and lo and behold, he looks out and sees on the rooftop uh, of a neighboring house, the 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 woman Bathsheba, and she's bathing. The text is very explicit. She's bathing. This is a purification rite after her period, and she's very very pretty. And oh, by the way, her husband Uriah the Hittite is one of David's elite soldiers, a group called the Thirty, and he's out at the front. Notice the name Uriah the Hittite. It's a bit peculiar because Uriah is a true Hebrew name. I mean, something like Yahweh is my light. But he's always called the Hittite, and so let's think of him. Let's think of him as a resident alien, mm, because mm-hmm. there, because that will help us understand the levels of injustice in the story. He's a resident alien fighting for David. He's married to an Israelite woman named Bathsheba. He's out doing his duty at the front. Bathsheba's doing her duty as it was understood in priestly circles in terms of this purification. David sees her, and David wants her. So there's one piece here that I want to throw in because it's one that is often twisted uh, to say that somehow Bathsheba was seducing David Mm -hmm. because there's this really bad tendency within Christianity, especially to, you know, blame women, whether it's a snake or whether, you know, all kinds of things to, to blame women and uh, for the sexual desire of men and to put it on women. And so it's really important to understand that bathing on the rooftop was not an unusual thing. 
this is a, is a normal thing to do, especially in the afternoon when the heat gets very, very um, built up in the homes. And so if you're going to do anything, you're going to probably do it on the rooftops. And um, so this was, you know, this was not a, a culture in which any form of, of nudity was suggestive or provocative. And I think that's really essential to, to understand that Bathsheba is not doing anything that would have drawn attention normally. So uh, David has people check out, see whether there's any guys in the house over there, right? Because then she will be alone. Because he doesn't know who she is yet. Right. So. So he asks, well, who is she? Yes. Yeah, and she's this and she's Bathsheba. And you know, so, so David sends people. And the text says they went and got her. Mm -hmm. Now, I can't tell you, I see this in commentaries all the time that describe what happens as an affair. No, there's not consent involved here. People from the Davidic monarch, the king, went and got her. The text says, and she came. Well, she had no choice. Right. right there. So in other words, you really have to see there are elements of coercion all through this story. Monarch, uh, woman. Male, woman. Um, patriarchal culture, woman way down low. Mm -hmm. And so this story, needs to, what happens next, it needs to be seen as a rape. So he, I think it, it's important to really make it clear what the text says. He didn't summon her and she responded to his summons. He right. sent people to... Get forcibly her. bring her to him. They yeah. went to get her. So right. the text says. And in this part of the story, she says, she, and, "Okay, so here, mm, so so David sent men, messengers to get her, and she came to him, and he lay with her." All right. But, there's, yeah. Go ahead, Jeremy. Sorry. But you can not even dinner first. I mean, there's just. <laughs> that's just appalling. No, I mean, I make light because it's just awful. And, and you have to kind of process that because it's not the way the story is told or even understood generally. And, and this is one of the places where we want to fancy this up for today and, and make David um, fit our, our appropriateness, appropriateness standards. But this probably was not unusual at all in his day. Uh, that this kind of it's sense not unusual in this day. Good point. Mm -hmm. In the sense of entitlement, because he's a man, and you know, in this culture, as in many cultures today, women don't get to make choices. They don't get to say no. I mean, there's still a lot of cultures in our world where uh, women don't get to say no and have it heard as anything at all. So. This is a reality. We need to let this text describe to us the culture of that time and, and place. And, and need to be very aware of all of the digital recordings. I wanted to say tapes. That's old language. All the digital <laughs> recordings that are playing in especially white males' heads when they read this story and all kinds of assumptions that are made that the text does not bear out. Mm -hmm. And by the way, if you read this in the, in the larger narrative of Samuel, there's an earlier story about one of David's wives named Michal, who is the youngest yeah. daughter of Saul. Michal is passed around as if she's yeah, a tradable is, commodity. This is one of the things that, that Karen had, had questions about as we were, we were looking yeah. for. So yeah, we're going to, we're going to talk about Michal a little bit as we get to my question part, because okay. that's, um, that helps for me at least. And I think it will help our listeners kind of see this in its bigger context than just uh, David and Bathsheba. I think that's really important. Sorry for interrupting. No, no, that's no, fine. No, <laughs> I just wanted to make sure we got that piece. This is started. This is this is a class, and we're just going back and forth. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so then the story goes from bad to worse, mm -hmm. right? So, in this part of the narrative, the only thing Bathsheba says is, "I'm pregnant." And this her, is in Second Samuel. The right. only the only actual thing we hear her say. Right. So her husband, uh, Uriah, the resident alien, uh, with or without a green card, not sure. He's a resident <laughs> alien with a Hebrew name. He's out fighting for David on the front lines. 
And when, she, when, uh, when Bathsheba is pregnant because of David, David now goes into cover-up mode, mm-hmm. right? And so as we tell our students when we're working through the story, there is no 1-800 who's the father in, in this time and place. You can't, you can't do a DNA test, right? So David sends a message to the front lines for a special meeting with Uriah. Very unusual to pull somebody off the front lines. Come back to the king. And David basically tries to get Uriah <laughs> to go yeah. home and sleep with, with, uh, with Bathsheba. Have sex with his wife. Right? David says, uh, uses the euphemism, go home, wash your feet, which is a euphemism in the Hebrew Bible for the feet are the, often the genitals. Go home and have sex. And Uriah, the resident alien, is being faithful to his vow, his military vow to not have sex as long as he's in combat. He refuses to do that. He sleeps outside, I think. Sleeps, right. yeah. And where, where outside the, the door, I think, is where he... He's and where the yeah. servants are. So he, so everybody knows. And there is also this possibility that, that he senses that there's trickery about, and he, he doesn't want to be um, tricked into being unfaithful to his vow. So <laughs> it may be that he's just a really honest person, but it may also be that he's like, wait a minute. Are you testing my commitment to right. what I've agreed yeah, yeah, to yeah. do? Mm-hmm. Exactly. So it's really important here at this point in the story, Bathsheba, who has been coerced and raped, she's depicted as faithful to what she knows of the the Mosaic Covenant. She's doing this ritual bath. Uriah, the resident alien, either with or without a green card, we don't know. He's come back from the front, and he's being faithful to his vows. They are more faithful to Yahweh than David is. And David's like, I got to do something else. This isn't working. Because he can't get Uriah to to cover his mistake by having sex with his wife. And then we can say, yep, yeah, this was, this was his baby. So your eye is not cooperating. So um, David, I would say desperate uh, desperation creates all kinds of blindness. He's like, I've, I've got to get rid of Uriah because he's, he's going to know. And now all the servants in his household are going to know because they know he didn't have sex with his wife so he he works it out that he sends a message with Uriah back to the front to give to the commander which is basically it's a sealed one so he doesn't know what it says but it basically is is his death um (laughs) the plan for his death which basically David says yeah you guys go into battle and then I'll pull back and but don't don't let uh, Uriah know, and and basically set him up to be killed in battle. Yeah. Send him to the front. Right. Send him to the front mm-hmm. with his death warrant in his hand, and that's what death happens. Warrant. Right? That's yeah. the word I was looking for. Good. Thank yeah. you. So, so then the word comes back that he that Uriah was killed, and David's like, the, the sword takes one, and now another. You know, it just just happens. You know, though so he's responsible now for the murder for setting up the murder, right? And. Uh, so, and he's also, he's also committed adultery and he is also coveted his neighbor's wife. Well, let's see. So he's at least on three commandments. Born false witness. So that's, uh, he's on he's four. Lying as well. mm-hmm. Yeah. He's, he's working on all the big 10 here, basically. And, <laughs> and I don't mean football or basketball. <laughs> um, right. So, uh, but it's multiple layers of his um, behavior. It's not just one thing. We're talking multiple things. Exactly. And I think this is another thing we can identify with in our time. And I might be jumping ahead a little bit here, but it's this sense that somehow this is a a patriarchy issue Mm -hmm. that men in power must worry more about their appearance, how they're seen than about reality. And David is desperate for this to not be seen for what it is. Yeah. And, and that's true today. I mean, right. we, we see it all. Oh, the, yeah. Uh, especially men of privilege um, doing whatever they think is necessary to keep their, um, their the image of them the way they want it to be. 
And that and that men always just get what they want, right? Well, and or that they, it's that it's okay if other people suffer in order for them right. to keep that right in front of people. And so notice when we pay attention to these really like difficult details of the text, how the text is now becoming a mirror, a magnifying glass, because we can begin to see our social mm-hmm. gender sexual realities through the text too. Right? And and so the whole Me Too movement is this is the kind of situations in which the necessity to speak um, is, is as real now as it was in this time. So David takes Bathsheba into his harem. Right. Um, And it's so cool. I I love this line at the end of chapter 11, the, the the narrator of the story says, but the thing that David did displeased Yahweh. Right. It's just like, so this is a place where the commentary on the text that's in the text is reminding the reader, this was really messed up. Mm -hmm. This was really messed up. And that God isn't condoning this kind of behavior. So then the next, the next, this is the, I guess we'll call it the third scene in the play is the prophet Nathan. And, you know, in our, in our next two podcasts, we'll deal with, with prophets explicitly, but Nathan, Nathan is a prophet. The word prophet in Hebrew is Navi, and it means somebody who's been called, who has a divine call. And he's, and many, many prophets in the Hebrew Bible are connected to kings. They're, they're like the king's counselors and something like that, which, which led to constant abuse because the prophet could say, Oh, King, what, whatever you do is what Yahweh wants. It's, you're so <laughs> wonderful. You know, it's, it's a, uh, you know, a sing- yes man kind yeah. of thing. <laughs> Nathan is not that kind of prophet. So then Nathan comes into David and says, I got a little story to tell you, David. Yes, this gets really interesting here with the uh, the mirror in front of David. Let's yes. talk about Nathan's response to David. Before you tell the story, my question from what we just talked about, when you talked about David not wanting this to come out, to cover it, and it's not so much the fear of what his colleagues will think of him, but it's what what Nathan and what Nathan represents, Mm -hmm. um, knowing this about him. And what the people, especially faithful people, faithful to God, will have to see. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the yeah. Story. Well, and it, and it, here's one of the the tricky parts about the monarchy in in as it's developing, is that it's not just seen as a political necessity. There's the implication that somehow God is well, may, God may have anointed them, but also that they they speak for God in some ways, or they represent God in some ways. And that gets this, that makes this all very tricky, especially David's not wanting faithful people to see who he really is. So Nathan, Nathan does the very prophetic job of calling out the King. And this is a, in the ancient Near East, all kinds of monarchies had prophet figures, sage figures attached to their courts who were primarily yes men and sometimes yes women who were there to, to give the divine, divine assurance, the assurance from the gods that whatever the monarch was doing was right. And Nathan is not going to do that. Nathan says, tells the story in which David condemns himself. And so. <laughs> not, not knowingly. Not knowing. David, <laughs> I'll, David. I'll go ahead and read it. Yeah, this read is, this it. is, this is so the cool. beginning of, of chapter 12 in, in uh, Second Samuel. So there were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. He brought it up and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his meager fare and drink from his cup and lie in his bosom. And it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man and he was loath to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guest who had come to him. So this is a story that Nathan told David. David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. 
he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And then Nathan says to David, you are the man. Ouch. And, yeah. Yeah. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed, anointed you king over Israel and I ask, I rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom and gave, and he's saying, if you wanted something, ask for it. But to, to simply take uh, this that that does not belong to you. And you, can, and you can interpret that in a lot of ways, whether the taking of Bathsheba or the taking of sex from Bathsheba, um, that this is not okay. This is not acceptable. So, uh, and then there's, a, then there's some kind of curses on David because of this. It's, this is a, this is a story, not just a drama, it's a trauma. Yes. Right. And the trauma is Bathsheba's. Yes. Cause yeah. And it, because what happens later, one of the, the consequences of David's action is that the, the child that Bathsheba bears will after, after it's born will die. Mm-hmm. And, but again, you, you recognize these are, these are books written by men and you start adding up here. What is the trauma? of Bathsheba. So there is the trauma of being taken from the safety of her own home and being raped by the king. And, you know, uh, there's so much to go into here, but I think probably, well, maybe not all of us, but many of us have heard women who have been raped, who after the fact say, well, I don't know if it was really a rape because, you know, I kind of, you know, it kind of made. I'd been I, drinking, and I don't know what I said. Or I felt, you know, it, his attention made me feel special, and so, you know, it, and that insecurity that so many of us women have—that we aren't lovable, that we're not worthwhile, and that our worth is tied up in the attentions of a man. I mean, that's all going on here, and so, um, but, you know, she, she. Her consent doesn't matter here, ultimately. And so to say that that this is rape, I think, is very appropriate. That's one trauma. The next is admitting, letting um, David know and acknowledging to herself that she's pregnant. And then there is the death of her husband. Um, We don't really know whether she ever knew how or why he died. That's not really clear. But she has, she's in this mess and her, her husband dies. And then she's taken into uh, David's harem, which he might think is like a really good thing for her. But um, her, her freedoms have been constrained considerably. And then it's her child that dies Mm -hmm. because of David's action. So there's these ongoing traumas throughout. And I think we don't think about that nearly enough to recognize the the injustice of all of that. And so Nathan's comeuppance to David about how God sees this as an act of violence, as an act of stealing the the poor man's lamb that, that he loves it is it is very powerful i think but it's only uh, the depth of it is only recognizable if we acknowledge the trauma that bathsheba has experienced on all these different levels mm-hmm. yeah. simply because she's a woman all of these things that make her vulnerable are because she's a woman and this will not be the last story of a woman traumatized by males mm. in, this, in the narrative of Samuel and Kings. So I, and that's just really here. The, if there's good news in this story, <laughs> we're looking, we're looking. If there's good news in the story, it's, it's this, that the editors of Samuel didn't scrub the story. Scrub, scrub, scrub it, it out. clean, right? Or either right. take it out now, or, or try, try to put a nice face on it. What's interesting is that the book, we call First and Second Chronicles, 
which is a later book. It's it's from the post-exilic period. It's from you know four hundred ish down to three hundred ish. But it's still describing the same time period. It, it uses Samuel and Kings as sources for its narrative, and it scrubs the story out because Chronicles is very pro David, and so uh, think think of think of Chronicles as the the news outlet that makes David always look good. <laughs> Right. And There's so news outlets like that. that are, some people just just saying. That? And so, <laughs> uh, so um, we can, we can at least be grateful to the, the Deuteronomistic editors. It's part of their plan too. They want to show that the monarchy was a bad idea, but they do not scrub the story. Even though they also keep that part of the story, which says God made a covenant with David. And by the way, God stands by the covenant here. God says, here, here's the consequences, but, there's still going to be a Davidic monarchy after this. So it's, it's a little, it's a little glimmer of what we will come to call God's unconditional love for us. Um, But also have to be very careful and remember that the editors of the story think that the baby died because it was divine punishment on David. That, that whole perspective is criticized by other books of the Hebrew Bible. So we just have to be careful not to say, See everything that happens is a divine judgment. Mm-hmm. It's it's the narr- it's the narrator's overlay on the story. But we shouldn't lose track of the fact that God sees David's actions as injustice. Well, I think there's also some hints about God's um, unconditional love because just as when we talk about um, Michal in a little while, mm-hmm. um, even here the poor man loved the you. The poor man, it was beloved as a daughter. So the writer is making the hearer of the scripture aware that there is this kind of um, beloved uh, essence, nature in the story that's that's compared to uh, David's behavior and which casts David's behavior in shadow. Yes, yes. And um, that there is mutual love that is happening in this time, even yeah. though there is also uh, love of power that then abuses people. Um, right. So, yeah, I, I, that's a really important one. And I, and the Mikal uh, story has that as well. So do you want to go there or do you want to do um, or do you want to help us experience this text in a positive light? Or do you want me to get my venting out first? Because I have several. I, I mean, I hope we can do both. But I know that <laughs> we're getting kind of long here. But I w- we would love to hear your questions and see if we can. Uh, and then the experience part will be some questions for people to take with them to journal with. So okay. that will be we can just uh, offer those at the end for people to think about in their own time. But yeah, I'd love to, for us to explore some of your questions because mm-hmm. um, we may not have answers, but they do, they'll, they'll no doubt shed light. So my questions come from uh, the broader reading of second Samuel. So I had read first Samuel for our last um, mm-hmm. podcast. So I had read ahead, but this time I read second Samuel just beginning to end. And a lot of things um, kind of came up. And some of them, I think, speak to where we've just uh, gone with this. So in in this particular narrative of David, Bathsheba gets uh, all the attention. That's who has been lifted out of 2 Samuel as the story that illustrates a lot of different things. You can Google it and find all kinds of stuff out there that's not helpful. about. uh, (laughs) Sure. (laughs) But what's hidden in there are some other stories. Yes. And is it Mikal? Is that how we're going to pronounce her name? Mikal? Mikal. It looks like Michael. Yeah, it's Mikal in Hebrew. Okay. So Mikal was one of David's first wives, as I read the story, um, given to him by Saul. Mm -hmm. One of Saul's daughters. Of Saul's daughter. So again, it's the political alliances Mm -hmm. that are being made at different times. And when Saul got totally ticked off at David for some other behaviors, as Saul went into his Macbeth kind of period, then we have him taking Michal back and giving her to someone else. Yes. And his name, if I look at it correctly, is Paltiel. Right. Mm-hmm. Paltiel. 
which um, when you begin to follow that storyline of McCall and then this experience of being given back, given to somebody else, later in the story, when David is reconciling with Saul's heirs, one of the conditions he makes to reconcile is he wants her back. Mm -hmm. And it is, I think, both the most horrendous and saddest thing Mm -hmm. I've ever read in the Old Testament. And I've read all about Joshua killing all the people, taking the booty and going home. And this is sadder because of how it's written. Mm -hmm. It's so So intentional. He says, David sent a messenger, give me my wife, Michal, to whom I became engaged at the price of 100 foreskins, gentlemen. So be happy about that. 100 foreskins of the Philistines. And he, I'm not even going to pronounce his name. And so he took her from her husband, Paltiel, the son of Laish, but her husband went with her, weeping as he walked behind her all the way. Yep. Yep. And then Abner said to him, go back home, exclamation mark. And so he went back. Oh, that's just so sad. And so my question isn't so much why is that happening and so sad, but why was it included? That's the perfect question. That's a good question. And because it helps us to see some of the things that the author authors want to raise up. They want us to see how cruel this act was, how there isn't consensus. There isn't any consideration of other people. Um, But also, again, it points to there being a kind of mutuality. There is possible to have mutual love and to have, you know, this heartbroken man who is, you know, pitifully following along and hoping that things will change and finally being told (laughs) they're not, you might as well go home. Yeah. I I think that's really important. It's doing one other thing as well. And this, that whole argument about the monarchy, about was it a good thing or a bad thing right from the beginning? One of the arguments is if you get a King, here's what's going to happen. He's going to take your daughter's to put into his harem or to serve him in his, you know, abodes. And he's going to take your son to wars and have them killed. That was the warning. Yep. And so this is that part of that argument still going on. Look, what we, what we warned of is happening right here in front of us. Um, I don't know if you read what happens later with Macau. So that's the next part of this yeah. is um, something happens later that we read, that we hear about as we're learning about the Bible growing up. Mm-hmm. We learn about David returning the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, and he dances before it in his loincloth and his his wife, clueless, if you if you just accept how you're taught this, uh-huh. his clueless wife, who obviously didn't understand the importance of this event and didn't <laughs> understand that David was dancing around naked because he was worshiping God, she chastises him for it. Well, that's how it's kind of yeah. tossed out there. And if you don't so know the backstory. So you realize that's McCall. And she <laughs> has every right to think he's a looney tune and be totally ticked off at him. Because this is what happened to her. Exactly. And she Mm -hmm. is disgusted with him for basically exposing himself in this dance of ecstasy. But um, she says, you know, you had no consideration for all the women who were there that you just exposed yourselves to. And he said, oh, they loved it. Right? Um, She calls him like any vulgar fellow. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) And he says, oh, those handmaidens think, I think they think I'm amazing. And so, yes. And so, yeah. And we, if we know the backstory, then we can start to see, because in the very beginning, she loved him. Right. She loved him. She wanted to be with him. And and now she has seen all these other sides of him, so to speak, so to speak. And, and she's disgusted. And, and if you... And you, I'm sure you have, you read what happens right after that, after she so, corrects him. 
it's not just McCall, though. No, it's not just Bathsheba and McCall. Then we have Tamar. Mm -hmm. And what happens to Tamar in 2 Samuel? So there's not just rape, but it's incestual rape by David's son on his half-sister, Tamar. And David's behavior towards that. Um, He's the one that commands her to go to his son. And then he forgives his son. I'm paraphrasing what I read, but because he loved him. Yeah. And it's um, what does that say about how he felt towards his daughter, right? Or just in general about how we cover up other people's behavior and don't hold people accountable um, to behavior. So we have Michal, we have Bathsheba, we have Tamar. And then towards the end of the story, we have David fleeing um, as a, as army comes in and he takes all his primary wives, his first tier wives with him but he leaves behind what's called the secondary wives and the the leader of the incoming army enters the harem and basically is allowed to Mm -hmm. uh, have sex with the secondary wives. So there's just layer after layer Mm -hmm. of this kind of behavior, which really mirrors David's behavior. And if we're looking at what it is and is behavior that is commonplace and accepted i won't say acceptable but accepted, accepted. In that so when thing. when we read this we don't want to take as you said our own lens mm-hmm. as women and hopefully strong feminist women that just go screw it i'm not going to read second samuel we don't want to do that and we want to try to have some value in the content but when we when we read through all that it's pretty hard by the you know by the time you're at the end of it it's kind of like oh I don't know how much more of this I can take yeah so I think that's a that's a totally necessary reaction to the text and there's so there's so many ways that the text is trying to uh, show up the monarchy and monarchical power and male power and male privilege for what they are. The the text does that. And we have to pay attention to that as readers, that the text is actually uh, a Rorschach test on our our own. It it, it can be a Rorschach test on our own uh, gender inequalities. And and that's one place where the text can be helpful to us. It's like, Oh, too bad. You know, we, I wish we could say, well, this is just the Iron Age. Oh, no, this is the 21st century. Mm-hmm. The, the, uh, this is this is us. This is the United States. This is places like the Congo where women are constantly used as, you know, they're 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 raped as a way of of diminishing them mm-hmm. and others. And demoralizing and, and, their whole. Right. So it's, it's yeah. this is this kind of stuff is constantly going on. And and this is a piece that I was going to say earlier, but I think it fits here, too. <clears throat> and and I said that all cultures have blind spots, right? We, we can't imagine what where we haven't been yet. So we can't always see what the injustices are that are just built into our systems. And so we can look back and we can see the blind spots that are here. But we can also see that that some the authors are are trying to help people see these as blind spots too. Yeah. So, so there's well, some... and had warned us about them through Nathan and his mm-hmm. right. exactly. Yeah. So, so there's some that starting to help people imagine there's another way. There's another way of being, of respecting each other, of living. But I wanted to kind of just draw that back to us and what are our blind spots? We have them too. We we live in a culture where we've accepted where th- what how things are as how things are, mm-hmm. and until things start to open our eyes to see that they could be another way, that's when we start to say, oh my gosh, what have we been doing? And I think this is a moment when that's happening with um, George Floyd, with the the pandemic and seeing all of the inequities. I mean, there's some people, some many, many people of color, but, you know, some white people too, who have been saying, oh my goodness, this is a this is terrible. The system this system that we're in, and, and we're all part of this systemic racism and systemic sexism. Well, you know, a big portion of the population didn't see that mm-hmm. clearly 
until Obviously. this last year. We're getting insights that help us to see what our blind spots have been. And so this is a long, slow process. And it's as, it's a long, slow process for the people who are reading about, as it is for us, of slowly being able to see where change is necessary and needed. And and asking God to help us change our hearts and minds so that these changes can become reality, which at this moment, we have more of a likelihood of some of these changes becoming reality than we did a year ago right. when, when so many of us could not see clearly these blind spots that we've lived in and been, many of us benefited from for a very long time. Yeah. And, and and the church that uses these texts as canon has to decide, are are, are we going to take the risk to be the Nathans mm-hmm. and call out sexism, call out racism, call out environmental degradation, call call out the abuse of of people? Call, I mean, there's so many things, and mm-hmm. or or are we going to be just you know a part of David's thirty, part of his court, part of his chosen people who are like uh, things are good for us, so they must be good for everybody, and you know. So uh, so we have a we have a choice to make too, and the text puts right. that choice before us as readers. And just going back to Mikal and to Bathsheba, mm-hmm. in this story, in their stories, um, to some degree, to this degree that they are able, they go from being acted upon to acting themselves and changing the directions of what will be. Mikal, she speaks her mind and she is disgusted with David. And yes, it's the text says, so he won't have sex with her because he doesn't want to have offspring by her. Because- well, that's a big punishment on her perspective. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. She's like, Woo-hoo, I'm free. <laughs> so depending on how she felt about all of that, yes, she might have been relieved. Um, but she did what she could do. She was honest to herself. Bathsheba, later in the story, this is in First Kings 1, uh, chapters 1 and 2, where with, again, Nathan's help. So read here, God's help. Um, she is, she's able to save herself and Solomon, her son, young son at this point, and put the monarchy back on track to, to, uh, with a king who loves God. And so she goes to David, he's near the end, very end of his life. And she says, um, did you know that your son, uh, what's his name? Oh, Ad- Abonaj- uh, uh, Adonijah, sorry. Adonijah, there it is. Uh, that he's just proclaimed himself king and is having a party and has all of David's you know, army leaders and everybody on his side. He's off here having a party about this. David doesn't know. And so uh, Nathan and Bathsheba reveal this to him and said, what about your promise? Mm-hmm. Um, that that Solomon would be the next king. Um, did you know what it is? Uh, uh, what's his name again? Abon- uh, Adonijah. Adonijah is doing. And, and David is sparked into action. His conscience is pricked. <laughs> Some might, in other places. And, and he, he remembers his promise to God, his promise to Bathsheba about Solomon. And gets right on it, and you know, and Solomon is anointed and made king, and the vast majority of the people recognize that. So Bathsheba's willingness to speak on behalf of herself and Solomon and the promises that David had had made, um, she is now one who is acting Mm -hmm. um, instead of just being acted act upon. So I think that's another thing to take from these storylines. And even, even within the severe constraints that are on a Michal or on Bathsheba, I think uh, certainly a feminist lens and a liberation lens would look at these texts and say, these, these stories, even within constraints, we have to say the, the, the whatever no we can say to the powers that be, we have to say it. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, even if even if it doesn't seem to get us anything, the no to David or the no to whatever right. uh, that is oppressing, abusive, abusing, discarding people, whatever that whatever no we can say, 
there's a there's a moral prophetic obligation to say it regardless of what it gets. Right? I think that's a really important that important there's a theme cum- in the story. cumulative change that happens. Well, it's not the last that we hear from Bathsheba or Tamar, for that matter, because when we get to Matthew, they appear again. (laughs) As people that God used in very, yeah, yeah, as important people in the storyline of Israel. It's like that genealogy in Matthew's gospel that includes includes them. It's like, exactly. It's it's like uh, Matthew saying, hey, don't, don't forget, they weren't just you might have thought they were minor characters. No, they're they're part of a larger divine drama. So I, right. I'm glad you brought that up, Karen. That's really an, an important. Yeah. They come back again for us. So all the more reason to pay attention to them here in uh, second. Their, their yeah. involvement in the story makes a difference. I do have one last comment on this, and it was just something I noticed at the end of 2 Samuel. I call it feminine redemption. After all this crap that happens to all these women through 2 Samuel, at the very end, he goes and finds some wise women. What? Where did they come from? Who were they? In the commentaries, it says, oh, they could have been like leftover from the tribal period. Nobody told them that they weren't important anymore. What's the deal? Are they like the, the crones, the herbal healers? Who are these wise women? Probably they're in the in the style of Deborah, uh, who was the judge, who was a, a judge. Uh, she was a military leader. She was a, a prophet of sorts, and and she was you know the early people came to her for advice as well as for counsel, and so I think it's probably that kind of uh, that sense of that within the culture. There are these women who are recognized for these kinds of gifts of God, uh, not just to them, but to the to the whole community. Women, women prophets occasionally show up here in the narrative mm-hmm. of Samuel and Kings. So, so it, it it's it sounds like they're their own kind of prophetic guild. Yeah. Right. That's good so, um, and they they may they may be keeping alive anti-monarchy traditions in their own way. So it'd be interesting to, to, to pursue that with a number of feminist commentators on, on the text just to see where they would, would go with that. But right. Right. Yeah, so I, I just found it interesting at the end of all this trauma uh, for women that we kind of conclude the, the women's perspective in the story with these uh, wise uh, women. I think that's an, an interesting editorial literary device, if you will. Um, exactly. Again, why was, why was this included? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Those are all of my observations, <laughs> questions, and venting that I had to do after re- reading oh, about this. Oh, these texts. It's gut-wrenching. These texts, <laughs> if we go there, and if we're willing to take them seriously, they're going to touch us. They're going to trigger us, too. And they're going to to challenge us to not flinch away. And I think I think that's scripture should do that for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, Absolutely. So, so we're going to go into the experience part. And if you haven't got something to write with, go get something to write with, and give you a little time to journal on a couple of questions, a few questions. So again, I just want to to start where we start with what how we're approaching scripture. So in this part, in the experience part, it's to consider how the people in the story see and experience God in their lives. And if you can find something in their story that fits or enhances your walk with Christ or understanding of God, great. But if nothing fits, that's okay too. Scripture is here as a servant to our faith, not as a dictator of faith. And so if it's helpful, use it. If it gets in the way, go on to something else. Go on to another aspect of faith building. So I'll take a little time to journal about the following questions. And I'd ask you to do this prayerfully um, because our, our times of harm and hurt uh, are sometimes hard to, to spend time with. And so to be wise in that. But the question is, can you identify with Bathsheba? As you remember times when choice was taken away from you or where powers that you didn't have any control over hurt you 
or threw your life into chaos. And then to take time too, to think how and where did healing and hope happen? And to make room for the realizations of those people or times or the presence of the spirit or another person reminding you of God's love. However it might happen, and maybe you're still in that process of trying to find healing and hope and acknowledge that as well. Even the longing for that um, is part of the process. So the next, and this is the part I was just telling you about in 1 Kings, where Bathsheba's uh, speech to David opens his eyes in a way. And, you know, God, through Nathan, shone a light on the evil acts of David toward Bathsheba and Uriah. And then later, the end of David's life, Nathan comes and warns Bathsheba that she and Solomon are in danger and asks her to help him keep Adonijah from becoming the next king. And together they convince David to act. And it's Bathsheba's speech to David that stirs him to remembrance and to action. And so in some very real ways, she becomes God's voice to David, reminding him of his own integrity or or whatever is left of his integrity. And so I want you to consider for yourself, when has God helped you speak or act for justice? Or how or through whom has God given you the courage or the words to make a new path in your own life? As we think of Bathsheba of Michal. So take a bit of time with these questions and see what it might reveal about what you know about God, about your story with God. Thank you, Charmaine. We um, are coming to the close of what ended up being a rather long episode about that. David, <laughs> Nathan, and Bathsheba. But I do want to give you the opportunity if there's any last thoughts or comments that have come to you before we close out or maybe tell us where we're going in our next episode. I think I would, I would say that any action towards liberative justice, however small matters. That's something I learned from these, these texts. And, and in the digging in and the going through all of those feelings, it, the question for me became, how do we get a changed and better world? And you know, how do we get there? And I think in this story, you know, Nathan's words, brave, courageous actions by people, it's, it's one step at a time. You know, change happens one step at a time as we realize, as our eyes are opened, as our hearts are broken. It's, it's one realization at a time, one mistake at a time, one apology at a time. Uh, one epiphany at a time, one little success at a time. And that's that's how we move forward towards God's imagined world. For, for next time, we will be considering the prophet known as Isaiah of Jerusalem, uh, who's got a book named after him, but he's not the only author writing in that <laughs> book. It's it's a big, it's like a big conglomeration of many of words from several prophets, but we'll we'll focus on Isaiah of Jerusalem, for which is basically the chapters. Isaiah of Jerusalem's oracles and roughly chapters one okay. through thirty nine, with some exceptions, right? Some so, always exceptions, absolutely. <laughs> a whole lot of editing going on in that. Yeah, book, so. and we don't have to. You don't have to read all thirty nine chapters, but oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> also, just a reminder that Font's writings on on many of these things are pretty concise and he gives a really nice background. So if you're, if you're using that text, take a quick look before you start reading, he'll give you some sense of the landscape. Excellent. Reading Isaiah will, will help us deal with, with the question, a good community of Christ question. So what does it mean to be a prophetic people? Oh, this is good. I'm looking forward to that. Not to reading the 39 chapters, but definitely to the discussion. <laughs> 
So before we close out, I think this was episode six of of Hebrew. So we're just rolling along here. Before we close that out, I want to give a shout out to my friend, Reverend Rock Fremont. He's a UCC pastor down in Arizona, who when I told him what we were recording, he called my attention to an article out of Christian Century. So listeners, if you're not familiar with Christian Century, it's a periodical of which you might want to be familiar. So I would encourage you to Google that and look it up. But there was an article by Anna Carter Florence titled, Read the Rape of Tamar and Pay Attention to the Verbs. And uh, in light of uh, the closing thoughts that Tony and Charmaine just gave us, I'd say that will be a really wonderful, uh, painful and wonderful read to help uh, continue to make sense of some of the things that we encounter when we read scripture. So between now and then, thank you, Tony and Charmaine Shavala smith for guiding us through uh, Hebrew scripture, what we call the Old Testament. I'm Karen Peter. This is Project Zion. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks for listening to Project Zion Podcast. Subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcast, Stitcher, or whatever podcast streaming service you use, and while you are there, give us a five-star rating. Project Zion Podcast is sponsored by Latter-day Seeker Ministries of Community of Christ. The views and opinions expressed in this episode are of those speaking and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Latter-day Seeker Ministries or Community of Christ. The music has been graciously provided by Dave Hines. 